Thank you very much for attending this evening. I'd also like to uh, thank our main sponsor for the event, the STEM Action Center. Uh, they've been a great sponsor for the IVRC this year, and um, we're very happy that they were able to sponsor this event, and we were able to get the participation of the University of Idaho. I'd like to introduce our speaker. He is a design thinker with a targeted interest in trans architecture, evolutionary game theory, and design visualization technologies. He's led large interdisciplinary communities of scientists, engineers, educators, and artists in research projects, including the National Science Foundation and NASA. He's also the uh, program head for the University of Idaho's virtual technology and design team. Um, on a personal note, I had the opportunity to sit down and speak with him several weeks ago about an initiative that the IVRC is a part of in terms of how um, autism can be treated with, uh, with XR technologies. And uh, I would say that 30 minute discussion was one of the uh, best discussions I've had about the technology in the last couple of years. So uh, awesome. without great. further ado, I give you John Anderson. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And thank you all for showing up. Um, an absolute honor to be here. Um, I actually am going to give a little different talk than I ever have before. Um, I give lots of talks around the world. Um, this one's a homecoming for me. I'm a Boise uh, boy. I grew up here. I was born in Idaho Falls originally. Uh, all of my life I've known Idaho. Uh, tried to get away for a while. <laughs> it's a sticky place. It's just because it's so beautiful, right? Um, and I've been back. Uh, I've been at the University of Idaho now for over 20 years. I'm a co-founder of what's called Virtual Technology and Design. And hopefully I'll be able to elucidate that a little bit more as we continue on. Um, I'm waiting for this game to finish up. <laughs> Might be a while. Um, no, but I, I wanted to start off with this actually very simple slide. Um, this is the introduction of VR to my life. <laughs> um, I was probably about three years old when I actually had the first memory of my parents bringing home. It was a little Coleco uh, Pong game that you plugged in and we had a black and white TV and I thought that was the most fascinating thing in the world, that I could use these little tiny controllers and you know, beat my brother in Pong, right? You know, or at least I'd like to think I did. Um, and it just reminds us of quite literally how far we've come. <laughs> um, I'd like to think we create VR worlds way more engaging than this. Um, but I've got to take it back to my original roots. Like I said, I was raised in Boise. Uh, my entire life I've seen Idaho, and there was nothing called virtual reality. There was no path for virtual reality. Uh, this was science fiction, right? This is something that was in our mind. Now, of course, in some research labs and other stuff, we we're familiar with it. Uh, there were punch cards being done even that were creating kind of spatial, but you know, at the time when it started, you know, a standard primitive object was a big deal. To get a 3D rendered CAD drawing of a 3D anything is a big deal. Well, it wasn't until late 80s that architecture firms actually started to require CAD drawings. Right? When I went to school, they taught us hand lettering in the world of font, right? And now what we're about ready to enter in this conversation, you all know. You're all here. I think we're all part of the same community. So I've been honored with it. But mine begins with this image right here. Um, Etienne Bollet, he's a French uh, rationalist, uh, late 1700s, um, again, like I said, uh, growing up, I didn't know a whole lot about the world, to be honest. Um, and suddenly I started going through architecture history and just eating it up. And this was a building by Boulay who had created, and this is a, a dome that's 500 feet in height, uh, massive, it's to honor Newton uh, and the advances of science from the day it was designed where the light could come inside and reflect off of the little pyre in the middle of this and reflect the stars. So it's to create a virtual reality, a world that was different than what you came through, all focused around science and visualization. And then at night, they lit it up from the inside to give it the feeling of daylight. And this type of space just so inspired me. It's like, wow, you know, we as humans have been trying to create this virtual world for so long. And, they, and the talks and the history of the space was that anything that your mind could conceive could be seen in this space. Think of that, 500, a cylinder, 500 feet tall, visualization, we call them planetariums these days, right? You know, and I'm producing stuff in planetariums and our students do all the time, it's no big deal. But this is what humans have been started. So virtual reality's been with us ever since, you know, we've had shamans and campfires, 
right? We've been using media to talk and tell stories and be storytellers for our entire life. But that technology has changed a little bit. So as my architecture practice, I am an architect. I consider myself an architect. Everything I do in the virtual world is through the lens of an architect, okay? Uh, this is my favorite building in the world. I've been here many times. This is the Pantheon in Rome. Um, and you also start to see a theme here. It was the sphere, the geometry, simple perimeter that really spoke to me. There's something here, there's space, there's presence. And when you get in these volumes like this, you can feel it, right? And, but in a VR world, you're surrounded by a very similar sphere. There's an influence, an area that you can see, interact with, hear from. And I suddenly started realizing that I could take the same images that are three-dimensional as our world, and I could flatten it. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, 3D, 4D, 5D, all these dimensions actually can be shrunk, seen, look differently. And through the computer, we know, right, this is the world we live in. Ultimately, everything in the virtual world is just an on or off. It's a positive electron or a negative electron. Um, it has next to no dimension, but yet we infer dimension out of it. That brought me to the sphere again, right, in Escher. Suddenly I realized, huh, that image that I've been studying, I could condense and I could calculate, involved me. And I could actually render myself within that same sphere and understand, wait a minute, there's something called a point of view. First person, second person, third person, et cetera, right? We start seeing our worlds that way. And our virtual worlds are also exhibiting that, right? Oftentimes we see ourselves in a different point of view than we see in our normal day. And it started to change my relationship to the world dramatically and profoundly. At the same time, start getting into science. And there's another thing here that uh, was kind of profound to me, which is a little stem cell. I was like, huh, as an architect and materiality and understanding our world and what is reality and all my studies in my entire life is what is reality. It's amazing I'm not locked up in a somewhere <laughs> padded cell, right? And that's one of the questions. If you lose a sense of reality, well, you're crazy. So, you know, guilty. Um, yeah, good. There's other things. I feel comfortable. Now. It's nice letting that off my shoulder. But no, then something was happening, right? This is, this is something unique. What's, what's contained within this information? And so this is Ido Statesman circa 2001. Um, and when I was preparing for this talk, um, it actually ultimately all revolved around this image, uh, quite literally. Um, when we start thinking about the future of VR education and learning environments for uh, Idaho, um, to me it started here. So I was a graduate of the University of Idaho by this time. I had actually opened and practiced an architecture firm here in Boise for a while. Uh, returned back to uh, work with uh, Professor Emeritus Brian Sumption, who I had studied under in, um, at the University of Idaho. Uh, he comes from a lineage of Buckminster Fuller. He worked for Archie Graham back in the late 60s and early 70s back in London. Uh, a futurist, uh, beautiful, beautiful person. Um, and we got together on a research grant in the late 90s that ultimately by 2001, um, it was called the Time Machine. So we realized with virtual reality is that there was something really powerful here. We were doing visualization of architecture and taking clients through spaces, again, this is the early 90s, showing them what it looked like. Very expensive back then, right? But we knew it was something different and we started calculating light. So early lightscape, you know, programs were some of the work we were working on. Uh, body heat BTUs right now. In VTD, we always say we make the invisible visible. Uh, you and all of us know that surrounding us in this room is an ambient intelligence. You know, there's radio waves, television waves, you know. We can tap into it at any given time, right? So there's got to be a way to see it, and there's got to be a way to communicate that. So we started working with virtual reality worlds, and that's where I, we left the physical and, or I should say tangible world, to truly just embrace fully virtual. Because at our time, you know, in the early 90s now, I mean, even though we had internet, we were doing some things in the 80s, it really wasn't until it was the early 90s that people started to kind of wake up and say, hey, wait a minute. They said, hey, you know, there's gonna be a future coming that is gonna be 100% virtually mediated. And this is one of those examples. I didn't talk to anybody in this, well, okay, my wife's over here, which, you know, and I've talked to a few of you. But most of us are here because of a virtual media. We've been contacted through some other way, right? But we saw something different. Not only are we going to be communicating differently in virtual, and there the physicality is going to change, but the way we live every day in our life needs architects who also are designing in these domains and spaces. 
So we, we, so we fully embraced it. So what this was, was we created a time machine and said, wouldn't it be great now if we could just take students back in time and show them what it was like? So we ended up doing the Florence Cathedral, the Duomo. The Duomo, Florence is fantastic. Uh, Florence is the birth of the Renaissance. Um, Bruno Leschi created some of the first kind of uh, reliefs of sculptures in these doorways and, and, and actually calculated perspective. We could actually draw and calculate mathematically what three dimensions or four dimensions even were, right? This was an enlightenment of a time, similar to like what I was saying with Boulet. You know, there's this idea of questioning and understanding which was staggering. So the dome, if for those who don't know, at the time when it was, uh, the cathedral was originally built, um, the dome was left behind because the aspirations of early Renaissance and Florentines and there was, we want the biggest dome in the world. So our cathedral and our town should have that. So they started building a cathedral. They had no idea how to even build a cathedral that big. There was, it was larger than any wood structures could support. There was no way, but they said, you know, we're so innovative and forward thinking, we're not gonna worry about that. We'll figure that out later, right? I love that. I think that kind of aspiration is what we need today a little bit more. Let's not, we don't need to have it proven and solved. We just know where we need to be. And everything should be focused on that. So my talk is quite literally that. We know we need to focus on advancing education, in particular in the state, that learning methods can be changed the technologies we use can be employed to do it. And so we started that track. So more or less, I'll try and hurry on um, with this. We created the dome and there is the first transmission of it time was developed and an oxen that could raise the load of the stones and instead of trying to unyoke the, the oxen to have them walk the other way, Bruno Lessie designed a transmission <laughs> that could just keep them going the same way, right? And so we started modeling them. We used little, I'll go back, back a little bit. You can see there's little space balls that we had um, everyone, my students laugh at this, and they're like, oh man. I go, what, because I had hair? They said, no, look at the size of that monitor. <laughs> um, right, you know, it's like, but we had space balls. I mean, we had all kinds of things from this. Um, and this is Keith, he was, um, sadly, he's passed away in 2012, but he was a part of the state board, and you can see everything through that expression, right? So he's quite literally in, in Renaissance Florence, uh, witnessing cranes. Uh, that were controlled by the hands. And so students were starting to interact and literally built the dome through a virtual reality world. Um, and that started virtual technology design, essentially from them. Uh, that grant was our first full art SGI station. We, you know, this was a V8 helmet at the time, which was staggering. I think the system just to run this cost us about $80,000, not even on development stations. This is 2001. Um, and so you can see where things start to progress from it. Uh, side note on this, though, I, I always find this uh, get image here, um, especially with Global Vision and where we're at. We can literally travel anywhere in the world, you know that, right? You know, we put on our helmets, we're there. You know, maybe we're not moving the same way, but we can be there. We have a sense of presence now, which is pretty staggering. And in education, that alone in education is enough to talk about, but I'll continue on. So that same sphere, you're going to see all the way through. I've centered myself through it, you know, ray tracing and visualization and modeling. And what is this? I'm an architect. Right? And I'm building things. But I, I didn't see it as not real. In fact, we'll get to that a little bit. This is as real. In fact, in many ways, I give another talk that says the virtual world is more real than the real world. Because it's the truth. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But that sphere has presence. It was something way more powerful than any material I'd ever designed with in architecture before. Uh, I'm really interested in self-healing environments, uh, things that have an intelligence to them. The most intelligent system that we typically have in architecture today is a thermostat. Um, and oftentimes, that in the old ways, that was a mercury. And then just like, oh, I'm cold, I think I need to heat up. Right, now we have much more sophisticated systems that actually take the BTUs of this room, transfer it somewhere else in another room, and, right, and starts to think, well, what is this material? I can't be an architect unless it's real, it has a sensation. <laughs> so I came up with this, <laughs> Velo. Um, I'm having some fun with it. You know, it's virtually fat-free, it's simulated matter, you can have intimate amount of servings, it has no weight, uh, sure, artificial flavored. Um, it's whatever you want it to be. I found that very profound. Velo stands for Virtual Environment Linguistic Object, or Operator, back in the time. 
It ultimately turned into virtual environment linguistic agent during the time that we now have agents and, and super agents and we know how we can farm that. But it became a substance that wasn't just something you could see and physically interact, but it could physically interact and see you too, right? And especially as we enter the world of XR and cross reality, which is where most of my research is today, it's just absolutely the truth. But this question has stayed with me in, in, in all my entire life. Rumsfeld in 20, uh, 2002 said it best. This is where I like to stay in research. I call this the aloe. So we can talk about VR, which is virtual reality. We can talk about augmented reality, which is AR. We can talk about cross reality and mixed reality. Uh, but then we also talk about allo reality, which is another one that will be coming here soon, and maybe in a few years we'll give that talk. Um, I don't know if we're probably here. Allo is the other of the other. Rumsfeld says it best here so far. Just there's, there's unknown unknowns, the ones that we don't know. Advanced to today, that little stem cell that we started talking about, right, that has an intelligence behind it that we can start to manipulate. We're growing cartilage, you know, noses, ears, et cetera, putting that same stuff, trying to now um, heal people. This is uh, in theory, I have not met this person, um, but at least in, uh, as the literature goes, uh, he lost his nose in an explosion in an industry park. Uh, they were able to grow a nose and then ultimately remove it and try and put it back on himself, right? So to me, reality changed dramatically with that little stem cell and material, right? My vision of the world is different now. I'm an architect going in here that says even the biological things that we've always held as real suddenly have this little kind of weird thing to it that changes our sense of what reality really is. So what is that? We all talk about virtual reality. Um, I do it with my students all the time. To me, this is the image, the quintessential image right here. What do you see? I'm treating you all as my students now. There will be a test afterward. A road, yeah, you know, obvious, <laughs> right? It's a road off to the horizon. There's all kind of metaphors for this, everything else. Only thing I care about in this image are those paint strips. That's about the best example of virtual I can come up with. Is it real? Yeah, yeah, that's a road. No, that's paint on a road that we all agree on. Do you want to pass on this road? It's telling you not to, but actually everything inside my gut, if I was driving, I actually did a long road trip back to South Dakota. This looks like Montana to me. Um, I'm passing on that road, no car's coming, that's easy, no. But we have a virtual concept of what that image means to us. We have a, a virtual concept of what that paint is. Is that paint an actual barrier that's keeping my car in the right lane? No, the only thing it's doing is trying to get me a little information to let me make up that decision. And if we all don't, don't buy into what virtual means in this case, we all die. And that's humans. We have such virtual perceptions on objects and things and places that we put on that become real. And the, what we have to do in virtual reality and education is actually untrain ourselves a little bit to allow ourselves to paint some new lines. Reality. So virtual is, is I'll, I'll give the answer, is almost. About the best you, that we can come up with for a definition of, rea of virtual is almost. But what's reality? Right? Everything we know. Right? Everything we know. So what's virtual reality? Almost everything. <laughs> so that's the, that's the area that I'm able to do research in. Right? Oftentimes it seems confusing. I'm an architect. You know, we put labels on ourselves. Why are you working on projects in, on Europa, IO? Why are you doing storytelling with these indigenous communities? What are you, you know, doing all these varied things because I'm dealing with virtual reality. It's the condition that we have to do as designers work within virtual reality, and I will argue that that is just called reality. So I define it, this is my definition quite literally of what we're dealing with. It's a computer simulated world consisting of software representations of real or imagined intelligent agents, environments, and processes. And the human perceptional representation for viewing and interacting with these models. Okay, I'm an academic, right? All right. Very academic. Essentially what it is, is it, 
things are real and things exist, especially in virtual reality, if we accept them. If we don't, it's not real. And sadly, that uh, transfers over to humans as well. We can lay it out. We have basic and enhanced. Most of this is what we're used to. I'm going to try and fly through some of this technology because my talk really isn't about the technology at all, um, even though that's what the title is about. It's really about people. You, we can go through all the litany of different products that have been out there and are coming, um, but ultimately it's a technology we're trying to use to see something. We understand that we have certain rotations. Uh, there's a limit to our perception that we have that other animals don't have, um, but that's a limit we also have to go past. You all talk about later, we do simulations for um, ecosystems in the world where we actually make sure that humans understand what that ecosystem looks like through the lens of another species, non-human. Uh, humans only define in an ecosystem service as something that serves humans. I think we have ecosystems to serve life. And so virtual reality is used differently to just kind of show how that can be changed. But vision's a big part of it, right? And we're, we're familiar. All the technology we're developing is based on the human, so it makes sense that it, it comes that way. But I will put this forward now that I think the technology we're dealing with is transhuman. It's beyond just human unto itself. So, you know, some standard, you know, this is kind of where VR started, you know, blue red shifts. You could have those nice blue red glasses, put them on. And if I, sh I wish I had a bunch, I'd hand them out to everybody and we could all go, oh, wow, 3D. Uh, not really. Um, you know, now we're stereoscopic, uh, where they're actually retinal scanning or we're seeing two images. You know, the technology behind this, as you know, you're rendering real time out of a computer to see something. Typically, you're rendering at about 30 frames per second. Uh, with this type of technology, you're actually rendering at 60 frames per second because you're rendering an image for each eye separately. It comes together and your brain does all the calculations and pull it into a 3D world. Uh, that technology has changed now uh, a bit, but it's predominantly what we're using. But you can also start to see that what we're doing is starting to move into a kind of some sort of level of presence with it. So when I started off with a basic 2D rendering of Pong, uh, you can see as we've gone through time uh, and the video game industry and the gaming industry, which we allude to a little bit, has been pushing this and driving it, um, but it's way more than a game, is moving towards full presence. That is where we're at. Uh, there's something called the uncanny valley, uh, which is this divide from where we're at now until we go to the world where you can no longer tell the difference between artificial and real. And we're seeing that in CG, right? You start to see a movie, though, that's five years old, and at the time you thought it was awesome, and then five, ten years later, or like the Star Wars, you go, Wee. But we're getting to a level where that presence will be quite literally um, unknown to each of us. So again, you know, with Oculus, we've got force feedback, so this is a little outfit that if you're playing a game, not only can you feel things, it, you know, you're literally getting shot. Um, our, our VR is changing now, it's not just helmets, we're all familiar with augmented reality and tablets and phones and how we're starting to enter into it. Um, I do a lot of work, especially in the mix and augmented reality, I'm really, I like that blend between the two, but it's, it's opening these new gateways of reality to us that are real, okay? Those things are going to make even more impacts to us. Especially when you look through this and this little sculpture to take you into the cross reality reference knows you're there knows you're standing there looking at it. That's a totally different way of thinking, right, than normal. We'll get to it. I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, smell. This is a, a smell-o-rama type uh, station. I've never used it. I had to throw it in here because I think it's intriguing. Um, but right, presence. Taste. Uh, there's taste on this one. Actually, the electrodes on this, they, they claim, I haven't done it myself, that you can actually start to pick up flavors off of these electrodes on it, which is really intriguing. Um, it's social, right? Our virtual reality, the world we work in that's driving us more than ever and actually cr increasing our anxiety levels higher than ever too is dealt with this kind of a technology. But not only do these objects and these places in this world know about us, uh, it, it's interconnected into a larger network of thinking. We're not even getting to machine learning and other things quite yet. We'll just keep moving. It's used for training and simulation. Uh, obviously, in the military, um, this saves lives. Um, if you are to go on a very 
uh, secret mission, uh, you should run every role play possible before you ever do that so that you're trained, right? And this stands to every single market, and we talk about education. If we have our students see experience, um, not be afraid to make failures, right? In war, what happens if you make that mistake? <laughs> yeah, that's your last mistake you're ever going to make. Um, I say in our education system in particular, we need to train our students to fail, fail fast, and fail often. And if they can do that, they'll have a tremendous success ahead of them. Um, because it's the, the avoidance of failure that doesn't make us advance. And so the simulations of these worlds that are happening, no doubt, are going to profoundly affect us. But we've seen that, right? We know this already. There's information. This is a lot of the information I do. I'm very interested in cross-reality, mixed augmented reality, where now we look across ecosystems and we can manage our landscapes differently with this technology. I work with a lot of indigenous people around the world, and I'm always intrigued. You know, I work with a lot of land managers, and they'll look across, and a Westerner looking across an Idaho landscape at the forest says, what do you see? Well, I see some linear board feet, I see a speciation, et cetera. Um, I meet with some of my indigenous people and say, what do you see? Well, I see my family. I see the tree that my great-great-great-grandfather helped to transplant. I see the roots that are tying in. To, you know, there's another thing they see, right? Which brings me back to something I always think is profound, is every single one of us sees a different image. But yet, how can we even come up with the same answers, right? When we all see something different, we all have a different perspective, we all have different information coming from it. Some of us, most of us in the room probably have gathered the same information, so most of us can have conversations together. But if we work with someone halfway around the world that didn't, it's hard for us to communicate. These VR worlds are able to open up the social perspectives too and how that is. And then when we start to embed what other people see in the world around you, it starts to change us a little bit. Suddenly it's like you can see the world through another person's point of view, and that's one of the most profound ways I believe is going to impact education. Uh, we're saving lives with the technology. Um, obviously telemedicine and some uh, efforts that are moving are going for further. Uh, we're still very human-based, but it won't be long where this conversation will be starting to talk about how we're actually having these systems save ourselves and they'll be thinking for themselves. So right now, you, you all know that we are training and we are the teachers for the artificial intelligence that will be teaching us here shortly. But for right now, we're teaching it. Yeah, I like that. There's some skepticism, but I like where that goes. Because think about that. Seriously, the system that we are building ultimately is going to be having the conversation back with us just very soon on what it learned. On to that, uh, this is, um, you know, thinking. Uh, Neurable is a company that we're going to be uh, also working with in our labs here soon. There's a few brain uh, scanning technologies I've been working with, brain scanning for probably the last decade. Uh, I can move some pr standard primitives by thinking and, you know, you can get some emotive response. I want this in my classroom immediately. I joke with my students all the time because you can start to get cognition and emotive response to where in this audience it would be nice too, who's really engaged and who doesn't believe in what I'm saying and who's thinking about something else, right? I can see through the eyes pretty well. It looks like it's a pretty engaged audience. But through these tools, you can actually start to see how your learning is really impacting students. It's a scary road to go down a little bit. Uh, consumer dynamics and behavior gets to kick in there. Most of my research is how we heal people, not to make sure we extract whatever money we can from them commercially. Um, like you heard with the Autism uh, Institute that hopefully will be launched here soon, we're into everyone's a genius, we need to find ways to heal and help people, and that's where our technology is using. It can be used others. But as we get to the brain, it's, 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 this is where probably the latest research absolutely is pushing us. How are these worlds? So in a VR world now, you have eye tracking, so it knows what you're looking at. And we now have brain scanning and sensing, so it knows what you're emotionally responding to. Like every great scientist, I took the brain uh, scanning technology when I first got it in the mail, and I tested it on my daughters. <laughs> they were at my home, put it on their mind, their heads, and I started talking about dark matter. And I'm a kind of a theoretical physicist as well, and start getting them some information that they had not really heard before. I want their delta and gamma waves on my little phone. It's like, oh, oh. Then I talk about an old story. You know, we all have them from our parents that tell, like, do you remember when you, um, you know, lost that, whatever? You know, I forget what it was, something embarrassing. And immediately went over to no knowledge. 
and it was like checking me out, and you could see it, and like, yeah, like they're not listening to me. But then the interesting thing, I went back to the same topic, you know, and this isn't a scientific study necessarily, but I went back to the same topic about the physics. And they had already processed, the part of their, their brain that had processed and stored knowledge had already been processing it within seconds that, yeah, they knew more about dark matter, just not conversation, than they knew before, and it was already picking up. Right, so our education environments, when we were tapping into that, is kind of intriguing. Self-guided, understanding, did everybody get that? Maybe, right? So it's starting to tap into the slightly different, but again, with a word of caution there, there's a lot of science that has to happen at this level. A lot of science happening, but it's pushing research. Uh, we can go back in time. I talked about the time machine. Um, of course, we can be standing there and saying, okay, what year do you want to be? What do you want to look at? Uh, not only back in time, but uh, I'll get to it here in a little bit. Uh, I do a lot of work on landscape, and so we have future climate models that actually are pretty accurate. And so most, and I do a lot of traffic visualization, a lot of work with NASA. I work with data that's 50 to 100 years in the future. Um, now, some of the data is better than other data, but it gives you an hour class of the possible of where we're going, and what we're trying to do is refine that so we better know that. So most of the students now are thinking about not just history, but future information as well. That's very important. Okay, so yeah, VR, we're used to it, it's awesome, we can go anywhere. I gotta take it this, so this is one of the places that we've gone, and I gotta brag a little bit of this. This is when I, I, I would say was, um, the I don't know if the first time, but one of the first times that maybe it profoundly hit me of what we were doing up at the University of Idaho in our studios. Um, we have a lot of students come in who want to work for Pixar, a lot of students who want to make the next best first person shooters, right? You know, they're just, all they've been doing is consuming data their entire life, and they haven't figured out how to produce it yet. That's what I always say. It's like in education, we need to train our students to not consume education, but to produce it, right? It's not about just getting the right answer, it's about answering, and answering your own questions and finding the ways to do it. And so with this, uh, Dr. Riza Balaga, um, Gustavo, um, uh, became a great colleague and friend of mine. Um, we were actually at my, I think it was Rhea, our daughter's fifth birthday. And it's always intriguing how you run into people. And it's like, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a microbiologist, I study parasites. And I'm like, oh, fascinating. It's like, what do you do? Well, I, I'm an architect that works in virtual reality. I do a lot of visualization and simulations. Like, huh, interesting. And then I started talking. I was like, well, what if I brought my students into your lab and you just talk to them? It's like, sure, that'd be great. Maybe we do some visualizations. And it's like, sure. Just go into my studio and go, hey, okay, we're going to have a scientist come in today. We're going to do a scientific visualization project for the next six weeks. <laughs> right? Science. I took that already. I'm done with it. My core is done. Right? These are comments you get. It's like, your core is done? You don't need science anymore? Really? And they're like, yeah. And they're so upset with me. Seriously, upset with me. And it's like, well, we're going to do it. John, we want to create the next Hollywood monster. It's like, no. You're doing science, and you have a client, and this is a service, and you need to serve. You know, and they start learning, and it's like, okay. And they start talking about this parasite, and I'm like, okay, we need a visualization. And then all of a sudden, they make this parasite kind of look like a torpedo, and it's like shooting through the body, and it's like not even close to accurate. And then we show the scientists, and they're like, whoa, what are these guys doing? And you know, you go through the design process. We're designers. And all of a sudden, they get a little more information, and they kind of buy into it a little bit more, and they do a little bit more, a little bit more. Well, these are screenshots of a, a, an animation that was a seven minute animation talking about the entire mobility, intrusion, the entire life cycle of this parasite. This parasite's three microns in length. It has hardly ever been even visualized. We were getting some of the earliest scans of the thing ever. They suddenly start creating platforms to look at the anatomy of this, the coenoids, the rogue trees. They're, there's the actin myosin that has this double shell that is able to move itself through the body. It happens to do something called a kiss and spit sequence to get into a cell where it actually makes an incision into the cell, spits in proteins to prepare the protein for invasion. It puts a glue, wraps it around it. It's the smallest junction we know of in humans. It pulls the skin of the cell around itself and goes inside of our red blood cells or anything else and sits there. And all the cell can do is fill itself because it's used its own skin while it slowly starts 
moving and manipulating, creating the energies for this thing to grow, then it starts dividing and growing. It goes from two, it goes binary. It goes from one to two to four to eight to 16 to 32 to 64 to 128, right? All the numbers we're familiar with. It's actually kind of intriguing until it gets to a point where if your immune system is fine, it'll go dormant, it creates these little vacuoles and sits there in your body unless you're compromised with AIDS, cancer or something. And then they erupt and they start destroying your cells again. And people can die. You know, and this parasite is very similar to the one that passes on malaria, right? And so then the students are finally at the end coming in, this is the most kick ass monster we've ever built. <laughs> right? Like, thank you. Because it was the truth. They couldn't even, like, the, the science was cool. And not only was science cool, it made their fantasy characters even cooler. You know, because one person literally created this monster that could spit in something that prepared itself and then it was mutating itself. Like, the imagination took off, right? And suddenly, suddenly education starts happening finally. Right? They're now asking the questions. And I remember it was one of the final um, critiques. We, we do a critique process where you know, they show their work and then essentially we just tear it apart <laughs> you know, it, as much as possible. You know, good job there, but you should have done this. Um, and so there's always a high level of anxiety going in. And I'm bringing in all the experts this time after they've laughed at them a few times because their science is wrong. Like, oh, I'm really nervous, John. You know, I don't know if I should Asking, I just ask questions because I always embrace your ignorance. All of us should do this. Just know when you're ignorant and embrace that moment. You'll never get a better shot because as soon as you know something, you you lose your chance to innovate, right? And that's the key with education. Is actually we gotta grab these kids who don't have any concept on any of this. They're truly ignorant on it, and hear what they're saying. So Gustavo, who thinks chemically. Right? So he's a scientist doing this stuff, and most of his tests are all chemical tests to understand even what this looks like. My students are thinking physically because they're building these virtual worlds. They're like, huh, that coinoid in the rope trees, that looks like that's a shape charge. It looks like it kind of helps the motility of how this thing happens. And then and they start throwing these questions. They ask five questions, and it's like every student always does. Oh, I'm really sorry, but this is a real stupid question. But um, how does da 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 work? Right? And then Gustavo was sitting there, and he had this pad. It's like, hmm, that's a good question. I don't have the answer to that. I'll, I'll get back to you. Five questions were asked that funded $4 million of research. These were juniors on a six-week project. I submitted their animation to the International National Science Foundation International Disease Challenge, if you guys have seen that, in 2007, 2008. They were placed in the top 10 in the world for their work on a six-week education process that then funded $4 million using virtual reality. Okay, we'll move on. Um, I won't read this, I'll just pause and take a little breather. All right. Oops, go the other way. Okay, so this, now I get to the introduction of my talk. <laughs> so I am John Anderson, nice to be here. Um, I am the research lead of what's called the Virtual Technology Laboratory, the VTL. I'm happy to announce that there will be um, a VTL opening here down in Boise in this water center, the second floor, uh, like we talked about Autism uh, Institute and others, uh, very also interested in the built environment architecture where we're at, but how we can integrate with industries, uh, in particular in our capital city, to start to truly innovate. Uh, I am the program head of virtual technology design, um, and then also the lead for our college, and uh, Dean Corey is here joining us from the College of Art and Architecture. She's been uh, in integral in, in, in establishing us and starting this. It's the United Nations Sustainable Development and Solutions Network. Uh, this was launched in December. Uh, the U.S. has now joined 192 nations. Um, and it's um, a, a large initiative, which I'll go into too, but uh, virtual reality is absolutely tied at the center of this core, which is essentially most of my research. Um, I am into fantasy. I love design, um, but I have um, a huge social conscience. I think the older I got, the more I realized is that we truly do need to leave this world in a better place than we found it. 
and that the tools that we have now need to be used for that. And my heart is at education at its center, and you'll see how that has expanded. But my projects I work with are usually landscape focused, a lot of ecosystems. There's a lot of the challenges we have in the world that I think are, are, are dealing with ecosystems and communities and cultures and perspective that we talked about earlier. Uh, these are some quick snapshots. We'll dive into a couple of them a little bit earlier. Uh, they simulate lots of different scenarios. Um, we're building new scientific tools in virtual reality for scientists to use, which is the intriguing thing now. We're creating tools and s subsets of things. So, you know, a software that creates a software that creates a software that creates a software, right? And everything we're doing is truly only within that virtual world. As an architect, I always say the most sustainable building we can ever create is the one we never build. If we can connect people and places and, and information to each other without ever physically building anything, we're better off for it. Um, unless we truly look at adaptive reuse and some other stuff, our practices in architecture and we think about the built environment typically last 20 to 25 years and we do it again, right? That's not the way we should be living actually, if we really want to have a successful life on this planet. We have to change that a little bit. And the virtual world, in my opinion, is one of those critical. I'm a neo-futurist. Neo-futurism can't exist in the physical world. It's about unlimited resources to create giant robotics, like have skyscrapers walking downtown Boise. It'd be really cool to see, but the resources to have that kind of world is impossible. In the virtual world, it's easy. It's our avatar, <laughs> right? We can do these things. And so that's why, as an architect, I thrive in this environment. OK. Um, I travel the world. Um, here's, I, 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 I got to get this one, because this is about education. So I'll highlight a, a project here in a little bit called the Salmon Sim, which is some work we did in Alaska. But um, it's, it's gotten a lot of exposure, because it really talks about ecosystem management through the point of view of a salmon. Um, and climate change in particular with this. And so I was back in Yakutsk, Russia, uh, which is in Siberia. Yakutsk has the honor of being the coldest city in the world. Um, it's hard to bring my family there. They're like, come on, Dad, find somewhere a little warmer, maybe? Um, but a beautiful community of people. I've never, uh, I've been there um, several times now. But there is this line, and I, I talked to elders there, and they're very interested in what's happening in the Arctic and how their story can be told. And so all these indigenous communities I work with actually are really wanting to embrace VR because it's a storytelling medium that they can tell their story. Of. So I showed them the salmon, and I gave a talk um, at one of the institutes there in Russia. And you know, it's like you normally do. You have an older crowd, and most of them, the elders were there, and we're talking science, et cetera. And then I went to give my presentation, and the entire room was suddenly packed of, of youngsters children who had heard that I was talking about virtual reality and ecosystems and they had packed this entire arena for this talk. And I get done with it and I give a few examples um, and I still remember the elders that came to me. They go, John, we hear what you're saying and we know it's important to you and we don't understand any of this, but we know we need it desperately. I'm like, how do you know this? I've got a translator, actually, and they go, and they just pointed, our children. Our children are here in this room, and they want this. They know they need this. So I don't care what we think. This is what their future is about, and we need to embrace it. So we're now working on education uh, programs for them to tell. But this girl gets into the Salmon Sim, and I've got a video you'll see, and you can see her in it, and there's a line, and they start going through it, and then we start having our talk, and she stayed with me the entire time. Uh, this is in the middle is John Waterhouse, National Geographic explorer, a good friend of mine, and she sat right next to me and just started drawing. She started drawing the fish, she started showing all the reactions, and then ultimately, um, I was told by an elder that this was her granddaughter. Um, it had changed her life. She, she said that she wants to work on making sure the fish are healthy. Right through this simple experience, and it, 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 I don't know, profound change for me. So, is VR uh, changing the way we educate and learn? Absolutely, right. But we got to listen to this generation because the way they consume it and the way they're going to use it is different than we see it right now. But again, we have to allow everyone to tell their own story. Because, like I said, we all see a different image. Why do you need to only see the image that I paint? I think I paint a pretty good image, <laughs> but it's not the only one. Right, so we have to hear this more, and this is a great media for all of our children um, and ourselves. 
uh, like I talked about sustainable development goals. So all this is pointing to essentially the, the 17 strategic development goals of the United Nations. Uh, limit poverty, no hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, right? All this gender equality, you can go through all this stuff. Um, all of us in all the work that we do impact these in some way or another. And all the job is now is to use these technology, try and get people to think in these terms. How can we at least add a net positive, even if it's incrementally small, to these initiatives? And if we can do that, our target is for 2030, because actually if you really do look at the, the science and some of the data, there are some pretty profound things happening. Um, and it's my feeling that actually this reality does need to change, and, and this will happen through of it, and VR will be a mechanism for it. Um, we'll try not to stay too much on here. There's a quick one on Idaho. Uh, just give us a snapshot. Uh, we're not doing too bad. Um, our uh, water is pretty good. Education tends to be pretty low, but I think uh, with all the effort of the, just people in this room and that I've seen in the last few decades, um, this is going to be one area that no doubt is going to be increasing significantly. All right. Um, so this is beyond now. Um, I think my talk in VR is about done to some extent. Um, it is um, a Kool-Aid I drank a long time ago. <laughs> uh, it is my life, um, and it, no doubt is making the uh, profound changes in education that we have to continue to invest in um, and also back away from and let it thrive unto itself. Um, and I think we have a huge challenge, but hopefully the next few years we'll advance that. But big data, right? So big data is coming in, and we have to understand this. Um, there is more data being produced. We are producing more data ourselves than we can ever ingest. Uh, most of us are taking more photographs now than we can ever recall, right? How many have taken a picture of your food? <laughs> yeah, right? Like, when did you do that before you had a phone? Maybe. <laughs> Let me get my 35 millimeter out and, 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 and I gotta get that developed. And here, Grandpa, look at that. <laughs> no, right? So we're producing so much information, and in my opinion, it's all great. I'm, I'm on the statistician side. Um, I deal with big data. I would rather have a trillion points that aren't necessarily clean than 10, right? Out of that, you get a lot of information, actually. You know, it's a pipeline. This thing's huge. We're working with supercomputings, national labs now, tying them to our virtual reality worlds, to try and show us worlds. And that's really what I'm getting at. The, the core of virtual reality education isn't this technology that we call virtual reality. That's just our automobile, right? People can get in that car and be a good driver, a bad driver, get in a wreck, do whatever. Yeah, they can go somewhere with it, but it's really up to the people and the experiences of how we use these tools that's important, right? Guns are the same way. These are technologies. These are things that can be used in many different ways if we wish to use them. Uh, so we really need to kind of almost forget about virtual reality because it's evolving and, you know, it's, it's a technology, it's, it's a science unto itself, no doubt about it, but it's experiences and worlds that are what need to be developed and experienced if we're talking about VR education. So big data, you know, moving down, um, this is a snapshot of a web, a data web of uh, related data sets. Uh, depending on how you filter it. I find these, 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 this world that I work in is beautiful. <laughs> what I love about it is it's, it's organic, it's natural. A lot of what happens is because it's just, it's the way it evolves. It's not manhandled necessarily by humans too much. Uh, there's an innate beauty as an architect. I know I have got an aesthetic of things that I like, but in my opinion, when I was in architecture, or still the architecture I work, I'd rather have nature design that building because the uh, wind in the area is a certain way, the sun patterns are a certain way, and that if you look at all the forces that are on any site, it's going to show you a different form than just the human saying, I think a square box would be best. Right? There's such an intelligence there we're not tapping into, but for that you have to work with data sets like this. Right? You've got multiple threads. You know, my students laugh at me, I think a little bit, I've got a few of them here, it's f fantastic, because I'm known to go off tangents real easy. The world we're at is because we're managing complex systems with multiple threads and causalities and relationships that you can't understand any other way, and that's profoundly important in education, especially where we're going. There is no one path. You have to look at multiple pathways of data sets to understand the picture that you're trying to design around. And that's not easy. 
Uh, we can start to embed this into global database structures, which we do a lot. Google is great. Google Earth has a vast network of information. This is a snapshot actually from a project here in Boise um, 2010. Uh, with uh, Patty and the Bass Cultural um, Heritage, where we actually uh, looked at Boise um, and we looked at all the boarding houses and we embedded all the data sets they had on who immigrated here to Boise, where were the boarding houses that accommodated that network, when were they built, when did, were they destroyed, and then again, who stayed there. And that was supposed to stop there, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of information. So then, you got a little time slider and you see Boise growing over time. But then all the information we started getting, there were actual people staying here. And there were people that still live here that know the people that were there, or at least grandfathers, right? And so then it became a database as well. Now each boarding house has a network. So we click on that. And you get down the boarding house and, oh, Papa Joe is there. There's an image of him. There's a recipe. There's this oral history. There's a dance. Right? There's so much information that can follow just that data set that we got into. It was staggering. It's a project I'd like to bring back because I think with the technologies we have, it could be very significant. And it was cool to see. Also, just you're in Google Earth, you're exploring. It's like, oh, that's my neighborhood. Oh, there was a boarding house. Oh, so-and-so. And it just tells a different story, right? So massive data sets. Uh, we're using a, a global database, right? And this I mentioned earlier, it's called the Living Indigenous Network of Knowledge, and we're doing that similar. All communities around the world are now embedding their information as to where, wherever you want to go, like in Siberia, you'll see it here soon, you can go down to the landscape, understand what the people are saying is happening in their community, see their stories, hear their stories, what are they challenged with. Um, up in uh, northern Idaho, there's an issue in Coeur d'Alene Lake with lead um, and mercury. Um, we have a group down in Peru that's dealing with the same exact issues. Well, let's connect them through this database. Let's look at their solutions. Let's talk about our solutions. Culturally, we're different, but we can share this information, right? So the world is getting smaller as it's getting bigger, no doubt. Uh, this brings me to um, a project. I'll give a little uh, call out to the Micron Foundation in particular for this one. Um, we're in Boise, it's very fitting. So we, we did create this, and, and I, I threw this one here in particular for the education side. Um, we were challenged with, um, at the time, saying, okay, um, what can we do for Idaho um, to start to try and advance careers, um, start looking at, and, and in particular focus our minorities um, and increase our diversity of understanding of STEM for minorities and, and, and girls in particular, eighth grade girls is the target. Uh, right around eighth grade, girls uh, in, in general start to fall away from the math and sciences, even though they excel well more than the, the males up to that point. Um, and there's, there's, that's kind of a critical threshold. So the Girl Scouts in 2012 did a study that said, well, a lot of our STEM curriculum is actually geared towards male-oriented topics. Not that females don't like a faster car or something along those lines, but typically it's like engineer a faster car versus are you dealing with issues of state sustainability and ecological health and some of these other issues that actually females are more drawn towards. And so we said, well, let's, let's create a world and look at this. And so we used that study and we created something called the Virtual World Village, which is a VR world, a gaming world. It could be desktop, it can't be VR, you know. Like, again, when I say VR, it's a world. We all know we can ingest this stuff in multiple ways. It can be in a planetarium space, it can be it's multiple ways. Um, and what it is, it was, if you will, is like a Justice League. So they could go in the middle of this and they have a globe. In the globe, you can see the continents and we have certain colors, you know, red being severe, green being okay. But these are ecological challenges that are happening on all continents. And you can see the players there on the screen looking at one of them. Uh, this one is, ooh, where this one is, I'm trying to remember. Um, I think this one is South America? I can't remember now. Um, but essentially, you get teleported to these, and then you started getting these quests and these challenges. In this case, yeah, this is up there. Um, there was a tsunami, actually, that had come through this village. And you can see some of the village houses were decrepit. Um, there's so many resources around that they can work on, and they're given challenges. And then you can see they have journal notes, and they have different things that they're going around to look at. Well, you know, to show, you know, essentially, and every continent had something different associated with it. Um, different dresses, different attitudes, etc. Uh, it was also uh, um, based on If My World Was a Village. It's a, a children's book. It's awesome. And it, it, it talks about the world as if there's only 100 people. Um, so we only had 100 non-player characters in here, NPCs. And they were scaled to 
the um, proportion of population in the world. So you go down to Australia, you have one lonely guy because it's like 54% males and only 1% of the global population. <laughs> so you talk to a, you know, this one guy in Australia and listen to his problem. You go to Asia and we had 72 people in a village all surrounded. And I just remember that with my students. What do you mean 72? Yeah, 72% of the global population exists within Asia, right? And they're like, ooh, okay. Um, and it's like, okay, well, North America. Then they realize we're only like seven. And then suddenly they start contextualizing global problems as it relates to continents and people, and they start looking at it. And to go in real quickly, I'm running out of time. Um, they, they have these, these authentic challenges, multi-user. They go in there and it's like you have to, you have to harvest and examine and take so much uh, wood to rebuild your structures gain enough firewood for BTU heat is something that they can calculate. And these were math students that would have to calculate how many trees they would have to harvest for the heat and to make it through one year. But then we have a group of science students doing something different and their task was water quality. Because in a tsunami, that's one of the major issues that comes in is you can't have potable water for anybody, you know, and you have to take care of the natural ecosystem. So they went through there and they're like, hmm, Okay, can't cut these trees down by this watershed area and this water is as critical, we've got to take care of that. And they, they came up with their plan. Well, the scenarios are gauged in such a way, again, that should be experiential learning that the math students could have an answer. The science students have their students. You put them together, they doesn't match. Guess what? You can't cut down all those trees and have clean water. You've got to make a choice. Are you not going to build this cabin for a few people? Are you going to have two families live together? Are you going to try and do, right? Real world problem solving, right? So that gives you an example, a little bit of where that goes. Um, all of us do this different. This is a model from gaming. Uh, scientists see things different. Um, socialists, strategists, these are all types of gaming that we do. Again, we all see a different picture. And so if we're going to learn and we're going to educate and, and truly take care of the future, we have to listen to everybody and understand their perspectives and come up with these solutions because in life there are really no answers even though through K through 12 we typically say there's an answer uh, most of our problems in the world is management like with traffic we did traffic visualization and talked about earlier there is no solving traffic all right you can only manage it there is no answer and yet we're telling our students there's answers in some areas there are answers but I think we're kind of losing a little bit. We have to have this diversity of perspective that VR worlds can do. Um, rapidly get moving here. So like I said, I work with very large teams now. I, I lead these teams because it's, it's been, I, I feel honored because as an architect, I'm still being an architect. Instead of plumbers, electricians, and my traditional subcontractors I work with, I now have nuclear physicists. I have you know, genomicists. I have you name it on my team. Huge, huge, huge teams. Uh, here we were working with three states, Nevada, New Mexico, and Idaho. We were tied to um, um, the national labs. They were doing our supercomputing, et cetera. Uh, this is one snapshot of one of my teams in the areas of these are all those dots represent a researcher, a different researcher working on a different problem, right? So these virtual worlds are integrative devices that bring people together to solve problems, right? That's advancing science, too. Uh, also involves stakeholders. Whenever we go into a community, the first thing we ask is, hey, I'm not the scientist telling you what your problem is. What's your problem? You tell us. How can we arrange our science and our university research to help your problem, right? And what can we advance out of that? So you can see this wicked, wild scenario where these virtual reality worlds are the only media that we could even do this work in. Everyone's so different, so fragmented. Everyone even uses a different language. I use the word model, and I used to teach modeling in, in architecture class, but modeling to us and modeling to a natural resource person is something totally different, right? And so once you get over that language barrier, you start actually getting somewhere. And some of that that we get to, so we have lar you know, large virtual worlds that we go in there, scientists are doing groundwater studies, running models that are on supercomputers uh, in another state, real-time calculation inside in a Unity world, this is a Unity world, uh, graphs, we're creating new science off this data set, um, whoops, I'll go real quick, I won't show that video. Uh, we incorporate the behaviors into it. Uh, we start now looking at general systems theory, network analysis, system dynamics. Again, this is talking about a way to involve our students in all disciplines. They don't have to be a part of any one of them, but they need to be aware of all of them. 
right? General systems theory is this general concept we all should have a concept of. But when you layer these, what you get is a world. We're world builders, right? It's very similar to the relation that we're at. So we're actually re we're learning, taking from nature, we're rebuilding it, and then re relearning from there. Uh, here's a quick shot of some of the modeling that happens, like Fernand Watershed up in Coeur d'Alene. Start looking at wildfire severity in the area. <coughs> Wildfire's a big deal, especially in Idaho. Start looking at the sediment that is transferred. We have cyanobacteria blooms that have rendered this lake inert, and nobody can be in it for over 100 days a couple summers ago. Uh, it releases neurotoxins in the water. If you ingest this water with cyanobacteria in the right way, um, you are dead within about four hours. It attacks your liver. We've, in Oregon, they've lost elk herds. Uh, this is something that's happening globally because our phosphorus and our fertilization that we're putting on our lawns, the sediment that's coming off a of fire has got too much of the balance causing the cyanobacteria blooms. Catastrophic, right? So we're dealing with these and, and, and not just visualizing it, but also coming up with solutions of how to mitigate it. This is one of them. One of them is we quite literally looked at the biggest one that was happening up there. It was just because the sediment coming down was from these fires and other things. Well, what if we prescribe burned sediment fire? We got ahead of it a little bit. And you can see the difference between the two, which one, if you were living in that area, would you rather have happen, right? So we sort of get community members. We have, I love it, had this 80-year-old guy in a VR helmet sitting there and he goes over to his house and he's looking at the landscape and he was just engaged in this. And this is that same landscape in a virtual world. LiDAR data sets, uh, we start to overlay. Now you're starting to see the hazards overlaid to people, making the invisible visible. We actually then highlight certain houses and say these are the, the houses that are in an 80 percentile or higher chance of fire vulnerability. Most of these have cedar shakes, right? They're not built the correct way. Suddenly they're walking their neighborhood, they're looking at their neighbor's house. It's a terrible catastrophic fire waiting to happen. They're all right, but doesn't matter if your neighbor's house isn't, you're not, <laughs> right? Gets people talking, right? You start seeing the world differently. I don't know where we're at for, uh, let me see what this one. Um, I'll just show this one real quick, just to kind of give you a shot. You know, this is 3D, and I haven't hardly shown anything 3D. So, you know, high resolutions. Again, we're up in Coeur d'Alene. You can see the Fernand. Fernand Lake is one of the he heaviest, most recognized uh, lakes in Idaho. Uh, so when it was shut down, it was terrible. You'll see these little red dots coming in. Um, those are actually XR dots. So the concept is, is that we actually have real-time sensors in locations that can understand water uh, turbidities uh, with the phosphorus. It's feeding back into the virtual world too. Uh, what we're looking at is actually raising and lowering the dam that's associated with it. We have these sensors that are tied to it. So if re real time feeding, I put on my VR and I can know exactly what's happening 100 miles away in real time. Uh, changes the way science is done in communities. Oh, here we'll just drag it over. You can see if we increase total phosphorus, it goes green. Um, We'll just keep going. Um, actually, I should show, we, and full weather. I didn't show the full weather. So we've got snow, we go into NOAA data. So if you want to go back to 1982 on November 2nd, uh, we can show you what the weather was like that day on that same location. So if there was a bloom two days later, you can go back and role play it. Uh, this is the type of science, when we have worlds like this, we can start to totally uh, look and do other studies from quite literally just a virtual world. And as I always say in the virtual worlds, if we go out to nature, we do our science, we bring it into our wet and dry labs, we understand it. If you bring that into my viz lab and we cannot create the same effects that are happening scientifically in your lab, there's new science there to understand. And there's a tremendous amount of new science we're finding this way. If we can't simulate and record, because in the virtual world, and I'll stand by it, we can create anything our minds can imagine. It's a huge power. Social responsibility, right? We can change physics. We can create anything, anything. I have not found anything we cannot do. Some problems are more wicked than others, but think about that. We have the power to essentially create anything the mind can conceive. Okay, uh, another snapshot real quick. This is up in Alaska. I was talking about, um, I did a lot of work up there. That's Testamina, Testamina uh, Glacier in the background. Far back, uh, this Tuscany Lake feeds in the Russian River, a uh, major tributary of the Kenai Peninsula, which is sockeye salmon, a uh, major resource up in Alaska. Um, I've got 100-year climate change data up there, and what we're trying to do is work with the agencies up there to realize what's going to happen when the Russian River no longer can support salmon. Uh, as of right now, the uh, air temperature has increased enough to where precipitation of the water coming down, the tributaries that run into the Russian River that are fed by rainwater no longer support salmon. The rainwater is too warm, it doesn't support anymore. 
groundwater. The tributaries are down by groundwater. Well, there's some interesting things happening out there where you can say fracking, uh, they won't say it, but there's been a five foot drop in the water table in this area. Those are gone. The only main run up there that's supporting this is fed off the Tustamina Glacier. Well, the glacier's receding rapidly. <laughs> it's, a nice, it's an ice cube. So the ice cube's there and it's great, but within 50 to 75 years, it is estimated it'll be on. So we ran these virtual worlds and scenarios to show what it's like to be a sockeye salmon in that world in the future to come in, 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 and show this to people that do not believe that the world is changing. I, I'm, just to break it to you, the world has always been changing in climate, always. It's never been static, right? So we just have to be used to that as a reality. Now, whether it's human cause or not, it won't go down that, but it's changing and we have to adapt to those changes. Uh, so we simulated it, virtualized it. Um, I think I have enough time, I'll show a quick video of this and then maybe I'm done. Salmon Sim is an interactive virtual world produced by the Virtual Technology Laboratory at the University of Idaho. Designed as part of an interactive curriculum for secondary education, as well as for a general audience, Salmon Sim challenges users to learn about sockeye salmon returning from the ocean to spawn by experiencing migration as a fish. The virtualization begins when salmon enter Cook's Inlet at the mouth of the Kenai River. Whoops. Ah! not game over. I can do this again. I'm sorry, I tried to pause that because there was a few points in there. Yeah. Start over. Oops. Well, I'll just, uh, there's a, f ah! all right, live by the sword, die by the sword. All right, here we go. I'm, I'm going to stay away from it and try not to comment, but there's a few things I want to point out that we don't talk about that I think is important. So this first part, you'll see there's three scenarios. There's an aquarium level that students can play with the science so they can see how it affects the salmon first. Then there's a cook inlet where they actually can simulate and be a part of it and they have commercial fishery. I'll explain. This is the aquarium. Water temperature in the upper left, you can see changing. This is a time, so you can go back in all the years, we have all fish count data. So you can reconstruct a salmon spawn historically and actually understand what happened that year. This is them in the Cook Inlet, each salmon. Now, every salmon represents a thousand salmon. Our computers, even though they're fast, for most people can't calculate the amount of salmon. Artificial intelligent agent salmon with yourself as an avatar in the middle of it. Up there is your stamina, is how you can't see it, but we actually have force of the water, so you can actually feel the force of that water as you're trying to go up. Promoting active learning through exploration, the Salmon Sim virtual world allows users to experience the spawn. Yeah, this is high water right in this area come in. It's really hard to get through this section. And you can see the energies are dropping. Morphological changes over the salmon's life cycle. Yeah and how salmon otoliths can be used to track their juvenile migration. Salmon Sam is intended to promote scientific literacy regarding the importance of Pacific salmon to the health and well-being of social ecological systems. In addition to being a keystone species on which ecosystems depend, salmon provide an essential ecosystem service with implications for subsistence living, commercial, and recreational fishing. So, in conclusion, because I think you also have the next slide, um, I have another presentation behind this, but um, we are definitely out of time. Um, it's changing. There's no doubt about it. It's not if and when or how. It just is, right? And so all of us need to, I think, in some sense, embrace what is our own stories, what are our stories we're trying to tell, and what is the best media. I think for the generations coming, you need to look at this new technology with a critical eye, um, but also how can you use this, again, to advance ourselves um, not just consume it, because I still say absolutely, as I said already, all of us need to be producers of education, not the consumers, right? And virtual reality, I think, is a mechanism, in particular what I found in convergent research, integration, perception, uh, we've only tapped into this. Um, so with that, um, I thank you, and I, I think we have some time for some questions, Jim? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes for some, some questions. If, uh, if you want to if not, I've got more videos I can show. And after about 10 minutes, uh, we do have a, a winner for the, the Oculus Quest. Oh, awesome. Well, the, I, I was having some virtual reality issues because we were advertising and also for architecture. Yeah. Because you can get
got a house in Noble, Alaska, a classic example. You want to sell something in Florida. So yeah. Well, and so you actually are speaking in an area of a lot of my research. So I do a lot of LiDAR scanning. Um, LiDAR scanning, I wish I should have brought it with me. If you're familiar, it's called a BLK360. Leica produces it. It's a really nice mobile unit. You can go and scan architecture. So with, when you're saying with, with the real estate and some of that stuff, telepresence, right? We haven't gotten to telepresence, but there's no doubt that as we get to telepresence, we can travel anywhere in the world through this. Yeah, it's going to change our markets. Uh, my mother, before she passed, had nice to be able to have her do a quick VR or something person before her grandkids showed up and she can remove it. Like Absolutely. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, um, especially in dementia um, and, and the Alzheimer's research. We've done a fair amount of those projects also early. Um, through augmented reality, um, it's very, very useful. Um, in particular, where did I keep my medicines and oh, yeah. what medicine should I take now? Right? There's some of these things that we can navigate and, what, and memory is a project that um, we had also worked with a person outside of Seattle. Um, we went through a major stroke, um, lost a lot of memory, um, and was trying to figure out, had a family reunion, um, and was using virtual reality, um, and everyone was, was, they gave us images, and you could put that together, and was recalling stories and why these people are important. And, and it was really profound, it's the same thing. I'm looking at all of you, and I know some of you, and some of you I don't, but what if I should know all of you, right? This tool is that way, and for good and bad, I mean, the other one I showed that video, you know, Facebook knows more information than each one of us, and I don't think, you know, I could probably, you know, virtually voyeur each of you and find out information in today's day, but it is an absolutely useful tool for, for the mental illnesses in particular, and um, huge, huge. I'm glad you brought that up in the medical as aspects. So, so VR for kids is easy because we have to learn about all the inhibitions in life. And, and so then it becomes um, that beyond the, um, or the Gen X rather than the millennials that, that need the exposure in order to, uh, to believe in it and, and see its usefulness, which is, which is uh, the, the group of people that are just, in a sense, entering the workforce to in the workforce for a while. So how do you use that as a stepping stone? How might you use that as a stepping stone? Oh, that the current workforce is um, more up to speed than we are? <laughs> is that kind of the, I mean, to me, I know what you're getting at with this one is, and this is the frustration, well, I, I say it as a frustration, but it's not. Um, like I said, you saw that picture in 2001, um, and we're not quite 20 years from there, but we're pretty close. Um, I'd be lying if I'd say that I didn't think that we've, all, we, we've lost a huge opportunity already. There's a generation that should have been taught. I taught, I was not given an education, but like I said, besides working under this one professor that was not available to me. I made up my own education path in life, made up my own degree, if you will. Um, had to. Um, and I've been very discouraged that my own professions in many ways didn't even accept this is speciation that I took on that I've been a very lonely, in a very lonely place over these years. Uh, it's changed, because <laughs> I'm not alone, you're all here with me, and there was only a few of us that made that leap, but the reality is, is that this type of innovation um, is for the future, and, and I've already written myself out of that future. I'm just trying to make sure that we have education pathways open uh, that I didn't have, so that the world that, that our, our the students are going through now have a different experience on it, and that, that the type of worlds that I talk about is not achievable. I'm a, t I'm a time traveler. I've, I finally admit that, that I probably am living in a world that's 25 years from now. The type of technologies I've been involved in, the type of things I can do, the things I see, the way I think we should be using uh, this technology now, oh my word, we're so archaic. We really are. And so I just kind of sit there and say, time will do it. So I don't know if it's advantage or disadvantage. To me, we need more programs. Um, it's great to see that more programs are being launched to talk about this. There's still not a program quite like BTD and the way we've gone, so I'm proud that that happened. Uh, but it happened because there was no other option, and the world shouldn't be that way. So I don't know. It's hard to, I'm not really answering your question, but you know, I, I, I kind of over time have learned that patience will and that the aloe that I talked about, the other, the other is coming, and I don't know what that is yet, 
I know they're powerful, I know how we've used them, and the best I can do is just lead by example and hope that the others will follow. But you know, for the, the hiring, I mean, baby booms retiring, there's lots of jobs opening up. Um, what I'm finding with my students is that oftentimes they walk into, and I encourage them to do this, is that the companies that are hiring you right now aren't hiring you for what you already know. You guys are five, 10 years in the future. Either start your own company now and do it yourself um, or what we're finding is they get in there and with one or two years, they're suddenly directors of departments and leading things. So I would say if you're in a company and you need, want to make that shift, hire the youngest, most ambitious talent you can and just let them go and your company will thrive from it. I mean, there's a certain side, um, also open up a strong relationship with uh, academics. I think our role, uh, that's part of the role to be down here, is we are very good at research and development and taking a risk that businesses sometimes can't and that we really have to integrate ourselves. So we have internships with our students, which absolutely need to be in these, and pushing and helping businesses to advance it. So to me, it's a, it's a multi, there's lots of things that happen at the same time. And I'm very encouraged at what I see here in Boise in particular as a city. Not all cities are making that leap. Um, but yeah, I, I would say kind of take that own risk yourself. And then also, by all means, um, reach out to your community colleges, universities, high schools, K through 12 schools, and just start bringing students in because you want those five stupid questions about your, quest your company, right, that will generate the billions to come, so, oops. I think one more question, okay. if you could also plug Jean-Marc. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Oops. Two questions. Sure. Okay, quick. <laughs> so, you talked about some of the uh, benefits that you see down the road for using technology that you're using today, that we'll use probably 25 years from now, what are some of the uh, negative impacts or negative things that you see might be trickling down, and what steps can we take, particularly in education, to mitigate that? Wow, that's loaded. Uh, uh, authenticity. We have a lot, our, I, I'm just, this is my own answer, authenticity. We're losing uh, people's authentic voices in many ways. And I think that the technology is coming around. I don't know if it's exactly the best answer for it. Um, the technologies, I, I, I can see lots of ways this is used the wrong way. There's all kinds of profiling issues. There's um, the disbelief of reality in general. I used to tell my students, you can't believe what you hear. Now I say you can't believe what you see or hear or even experience, right? So there has to be an authentic self that goes, this isn't right for me. And we all are challenged to be in those domains, right? And so I think we're challenged with authenticity because we are constantly being told by social media, uh, whatever it is, we've got to buy this, we've got to be this, got to do this, somebody's traveling more than us, somebody's better than this, et cetera else, and you lose yourself along the way, right? And so I actually think in education, we need to find more ways to allow students to be authentic which means we have multiple pathways of learning, and that's a little more chaotic for most people to look at because they only want the 90 percentile. We're missing all the innovation in the world if we do that. We have to have very open, active environments for education, uh, very open um, teachers that are open to multiple perspectives of thought and reality. Um, and that's my only answer. The technology is always gonna be there in some form or the other, and we've always used it and, and abused it. That will always stay, but I think it's truly trying to find an authentic voice within that education is most important. We call it uh, virtual, augmented, all the XR realities, but it's all visual reality. Yeah. What are we doing for visually impaired? I've got a parent with macular degeneration who can't see or limited vision. Anything in that area for bringing virtual reality to those who are visually impaired? Yeah, well, you, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, virtual reality is not just about vision. Uh, virtual reality is about all the senses, all the senses. So sound is, is more important than ever. Um, now the advances of, of um, our ability to have the brain comprehend and start to see images is starting to come in there. We're starting to get black and white now for people so that VR actually might bring vision back to the blind. I always tell my students that we're entering um, an era that we'll no longer have um, a term called disabled. We'll have, the only term we'll know is enabled, um, right? The, the Olympics I wanna watch here soon in the future is, is the disabled Olympics, right? I mean, you, you know, right, it's enabled. The fastest person in the world doesn't have human feet. 
uh, the person who can jump the highest does not have human legs, right? Um, I think a majority, you know, Star Trek stuff, um, if I'm blind, I can now see infrared. Um, I can now see things. I, we have deaf students who've come through. We have two uh, vision impaired students coming this next year too, where we're actually building worlds for the blind, right? And so there's games that actually were backpacks for sound that spatially you can start to understand, and, right? And so you, I mean, virtual reality, that's the biggest one is say, uh, disconnect yourself to thinking it's only visual. Um, it's not. It's about all the senses. And I would even say the seventh sense, which is communal. Uh, there's another sense in there that we're going to be more familiar with uh, than ever. So, yeah, I mean, again, enabled. We're, we're, we're entering an enabled generation. Okay, um, a quick plug. I have a colleague, a brilliant gentleman, Jean-Marc Gauthier. Uh, he came from Singapore originally, did some work at New York University, does a lot of work with virtual reality. He's uh, done some work um, on a, a, a protein, a virtual reality world, looking at the proteins and how you fold and unfold those. And he's on the verge of some patents here that would be absolutely staggering. And he is set up for display next door. And I really would like and encourage everybody to go see some of the work he's doing. He's one of our new researchers in the state in VR and definitely can be supported. You need to get to know him if you don't know him already. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to have him within our community. Um, you know, when he interviewed for the job, it was like he was one of our founding fathers who was sitting right there with us. It's mm -hmm. awesome. So I'm really thrilled to have him down here and he is in the next room as well. So definitely get to know him. I've got some cards up here as well. If anybody um, wants to reach out on some other questions, I'm more than willing. Um, I love this. This is my life. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I look forward to the future. And the winner is? There's Mike Taylor in the house. Mike Taylor? Woo. There you go. Woo. Uh, I think uh, on behalf of the IBRC, here you go for this. Um, we'd like to uh, thank you, John, for coming to speak. Uh, it was a um, it, it was a great time um, listening to you, the way that you think, and your experience, and uh, your depth of knowledge um, in the technology and, and where it's going to take us in the future. So we really appreciate your time. Look forward to hear much more from you in the future, hopefully. Um, again, we'd like to thank the sponsor for the event, the STEM Action Center, and thank you everybody for coming.